Hello, guys and girls. The program you are about to hear will be both fun and educational, but it is not a substitute for medical advice. Although we are doctors, we are not your doctors. Hello, and welcome to Travel Medicine. As always, I'm your friendly neighborhood internal medicine doc, Dr. J. Hey, oh, Dr. Santos here, your amazing pediatric infectious disease doc and researcher. Amazing's Josh. good. I still feel yeah. like you're uncanny. Uh, <laughs> was I uncanny? <laughs> anyway, Happy New Year, or possibly Happy New, Year. Happy New Year's Eve. Yes. Depending on when we air this. Yeah. You see, listening audience, sometimes we record this before we air it, and I actually have enough time to edit. Other times, it's done last minute. See if you can figure out which one this episode is. <laughs> With no context clues whatsoever, because you may, in fact, edit out the point where one of us actually says what it is. <laughs> So, Santosh, for our first episode of the new year, I wanted to do something thrilling, exciting, yeah. uh, full of clandestine investigations and secret oh, sure. codes. And I realized that your field, when combined with statistics, turns into like James Bond disease detectives. Oh, yeah. I, I think it's one of the most amazing things ever. And it is a very good lesson to everybody. You know, if they say, oh, I want to be a doctor when I grow up or I want to go into biology to still learn to love your math, uh, because absolutely it comes into play. Yeah, yeah. We are disease detectives, Josh. Absolutely. Well, we like to call ourselves disease detectives, Santosh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But okay. What you may not be aware is there is a full on what I like to think of spy branch of the CDC. And that is what this episode is going to be dedicated to the true detectives and espionage <laughs> agents of infectious disease. That is awesome. And I'm guessing that, you know, because we are United States based, you're going to be talking about the, the United States CDC and some of the cool things that we do here for uh, individual disease investigation, as well as outbreak investigation. Yeah, so let's get into it. And this week, we're going to be talking about one of the coolest named statistical based Inve uh, statistical based fellowships ever the epidemic <laughs> intelligence service or eis <laughs> oh my gosh it sounds so cool just saying it i absolutely love it yeah so you know shout out to everybody out there listening who's maybe in the eis we you know we think you're absolutely amazing this is a uniform branch of the United States government. So we are talking about something that has the same kind of uh, authority and uh, structure as like a military branch. Like the Coast Guard, but yeah. for disease. <laughs> I love how you picked Coast Guard out of all of them. Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to blow any covers here. We're not going to, you know, send out the epidemic intelligence knock list. Because we don't want to knock it. But, <laughs> yeah. but since 1951, EIS officers have been responsible for conducting field investigations, designing and evaluating disease surveillance systems, and communicating essential public health information to audiences all over the world. Not unlike you and I, Santosh. No, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Except they actually do the on-the-ground work when there is, you know, like active outbreaks and stuff going on. So not only are they on a kind of a different level than us in terms of the detective part, but they're also wonderfully brave individuals who's, you know, a lot of them sometimes are running into the, into the fray. So how did we get a intelligence service of epidemiologists? Where did that arise from? Oh, well, I'm assuming someone was thinking about the fact that disease is all around us and it's probably a good idea to keep an eye on it and have people who are trained and ready to, uh, you know, kind of activate. 
So the Epidemic Intelligence Service originally arose out of biological warfare concerns relating to the Korean War. You would have thought it'd be World War II oh. or even one, but no, uh, those were chemical weapons. We didn't start worrying about biological warfare until around the Korean War. Now, the first creation of it was originally proposed by a Dr. Alexander Langmuir. And okay. he felt that it was important to start planning appropriate defense measures against biological warfare germs, development of new devices, and to train laboratory workers for rapid recognition of diseases that could be spread among the population. His original paper stated, under natural conditions, we have done quite well. The problem, as it is now reflected, is that we have done so well, we have not had sufficient epidemics to keep us alert to the symptoms that accompany such outbreaks. We have had <laughs> no opportunity or need to be especially alert to the epidemiology of such rapidly spreading diseases. We have forgotten there is an epidemiological aspect to all our work. In fact, sometimes I fear we have forgotten that we have epidemiologists in our health departments at all. Yeah, and... Well, there are a couple of things here that, you know, I want to agree and disagree with. I do not think we had done well up until this point. Um, you know, the the uh, 1918 flu had definitely happened uh, when Dr. Langwer was here. So and, and plagues and whatnot. So he is talking somewhat, you know, recently in terms of understanding and, and addressing disease like uh, 1940s and beyond. But there, there is a very interesting point here that he's making, and it harkens back to one of our favorites, uh, John Snow, Josh, which is ju not just like recognition of, oh, this is what a disease looks like, like its symptoms and this kind of thing, but this is how you can mathematically describe the spread of it and locate the origin of disease and ultimately, you know, find a way to stop it in its tracks when it's spreading, treat the people. And if possible, eliminate it. And it's a real boots on the ground since early reporting is prerequisite to early recognition and establishment of our defense. Yes. The health workers closest to the population are the first to hear of any changes. So uh, Dr. Langmuir expected that the nurse in the home visit and the sanitarian through visits to farms and homes would learn about diseases in the local communities before they could spread to the rest. Like these are the people who you want around in a zombie outbreak. They'll be the ones who <laughs> tell you early on that like, hmm, something new seems to be happening right before it hits the fan. Yeah, so, to to go along with the the fiction analogy, this is also the folks who are most often ignored in like an outbreak type of a movie where, you know, it's like, "Oh, we're going to listen to some nerd in glasses." Like <laughs> Well, yeah, he, as, yeah. let me tell you about this nerd in glasses. Dr. Langmuir studied medicine at Cornell, yeah. public health at Johns Hopkins, earned his Ooh. degree in 1940, and even before the U.S. entered World War II, he was a consultant to the Armed Forces Epidemiological Board okay. and accepted a post on the Commission for Respiratory Diseases at Fort Bragg. Okay. All so right, this is cool. somebody who really had a strong military background. Mm -hmm. Now, the Epidemic Intelligence Service started on September 26th, 1951, with the stated purpose of investigating disease outbreaks that are beyond the control of state and local health departments, to enforce interstate quarantine regulations, and to provide epidemic aid at the request of state health agencies. You know, if we're making the Avengers analogy... We needed to assemble a team of talented individuals to fight the diseases that no one doctor could fight on their own. Yeah, yeah. So, Josh, correct me if I'm wrong. So the CDC had been established at this point, correct? Uh, not in the form that we know it. Oh, it, okay. So the Epidemic Intelligence Service's first staff members consisted yeah. of 21 medical officers from the U.S. Public Health Service. God, okay, so this was the previous incarnation. And 
You know, public health does start very locally. So it is important to train and, and send folks, whether they're doctors or nurses, to recognize diseases in a very local areas. But you need to be able to network them, bring them together, which is really what the current CDC does, and I guess the public health service. But they needed a like an extra kick of a of a service here. It looks like it, folks who could really go in when, when things got bad. So at the newly formed CDC, epidemiologic okay. intelligence was listed as a defense expenditure. The CDC oh. had a defense budget. Yes, <laughs> it makes sense because, you know, just like you were saying, we're thinking about biological warfare, but, you know, that may not be an attack from a government or an army or something like that. That may simply be nature going hog wild and saying, hey, there's a population here that we can infect. So listen to some of these early steps that were taken and think about how much has changed or stayed the same in our now post 9-11, post COVID, um, more modern day era. So the Federal Civil Defense Administration and the U.S. Army published pamphlets such as what you should know about biological warfare to explain to the general public. And the pamphlets at the time stated the main danger of biological warfare came from aerosol sprays that could be carried aboard airplanes or submarines, blown into the intake of a factory ventilation system. Oh, yes. Uh Secret agents could try to poison food and water supplies Plant and animal diseases could be unleashed to destroy food supplies, and a list of sample biological agents, so kind of them to include, was (laughs) plague, typhus, cholera, smallpox, anthrax, glanders, and botulinum. Now, yeah, yeah. and these, by the way, are still, many of those are on our lists of potential, you know, bioweapons, and, and, that's still part of our parlance today. Now, they also offered some very specific advice. If an alarm sounded, and what kind of alarm when you're talking about the entire country is a little unclear, I guess the emergency broadcast system. Sure. Um, <laughs> and probably o- over radio at first and then, you know, television and yeah. But when an alarm sounded, people should get to a shelter, stay until an all-clear signal sounded, and afterward, polluted clothing should be washed, boiled, or dry cleaned. People okay. should be careful what they eat, preferably consuming canned or bottled goods with unbroken seals, and to yes. boil all foodstuffs for 10 minutes, and use, you know, a handy service gas mask that we all keep around to protect against airborne pathogens. <laughs> Yeah, oh, well, now I guess the the modern day equivalent would be like our our wonderful handy dandy N95 or KN95, sure. So these these pamphlets gave kind of a weird mix of anxiety, information and reassurance. This is in the same era of duck and cover for nuclear attacks. So yeah, oh, no. okay. <laughs> so there was some safety theater going on here. Yeah, and there was also well Okay, you want to talk about safety theater. There was sure. also a television program called What You Should Know About Biologic Warfare. Oh, and, okay. And some of the things, and it, again, it was starring the same Alexander Langmuir who founded the Epidemic Intelligence Service. Sure. It was uh-huh. aired by the Department of Defense as part of a weekly John Hopkins University science program. Okay. So... The program would present a compelling case for the threat of biologic warfare and the importance of public health as the country's best defense against this. And here's some of the things that Langmuir did. He would turn on a blender filled with dry ice for a demonstration of how clouds of aerosol mist could contaminate a whole studio and infect everyone inside. Wow. Okay. Okay. He used a can of insecticide to demonstrate the working of aerosol sprays. And then after showing that, he's like, now imagine an enemy could mount aerosols on airplanes and cover a city with a vast cloud of infectious material at any time without you knowing about it. He injected colored liquid into the model of a water supply of a city to show how easy it was for an agent to spread. And all of this was, again, kind of meant to scare people into taking better steps against public health. 
So, you know, how could anyone protect or defend against such an attack? The only real answer was to build a complete biological warfare defense program based on the existing public health system, but using more effective sampling methods to employ faster reporting of disease incidents, more uh, spread out laboratory facilities, extensive immunization programs, and better investigations of all outbreaks of disease. This was like Bill Nye on steroids, like trying to scare straight all of the country into, you know, being prepared. I I love it. I, I don't think there's anything, you know, too, too frightening here. You're doing your best to demonstrate what can happen when things that are essentially invisible, right? So either bacteriological, virological, or, or fungal agents by and large, and you you can't see them when they're sneezed out or, or aerosolized or anything like that. So you need to have a something that you can actually illustrate and show, okay, this is what it looks like. So I, I love these types of demonstrations. This wasn't the full on science part, like the epidemiological investigations part that that's coming, but this is just to at least get people's, you know, imaginations flowing about here's the oh, this, all these things were done as a blueprint. This was a man on a mission. He wanted to take his military knowledge, apply it to public health. And this program was basically a blueprint, not only for the creation of the epidemic intelligence service, but sure. also a plan for the future development of the CDC, which, as we mentioned, kind of began taking place at the same time. Now, okay. before we go into what the modern EIS looks like, since 1951, over 3,000 EIS officers have formed from that original 21, and okay. they have been involved in domestic and international response efforts across the decades. So here's just a brief sample, and I know, Santosh, you'll recognize some of these. In the mm -hmm. 50s, they were mostly working on polio, lead poisoning, and Asian influenza, you know, investigating yeah. outbreaks of the common or concerning diseases. In the 1960s, they were looking at clusters of cancer, and smallpox. Okay. By the time the 70s came around, you added Legionnaire's disease, Ray syndrome, and Ebola. Oh, yeah. Ray syndrome. And so the Ray syndrome, by the way, was, you know, a relatively newish discovery of what aspirin did to children when it was used improperly. So in the 80s, they were called on to investigate birth defects like those caused by thalidomide, the new outbreak of a mysterious disease known as HIV, and oh, yes. a much older disease that we had known about but was popping up again, toxic shock syndrome. Yeah, the the toxic shock syndrome specifically was super interesting. Uh, again, a little bit like the Rye syndrome, it, this one actually came about because we had the super absorbent tampons, right? And there were these a cluster of these toxic shock syndromes, which was appearing in young women. And they had to go through and actually hunt down, oh my gosh, there's staph aureus that's being incubated in these ultra absorbent tampons that are being kept in for way too long. And then they had to go through how to eliminate the problem. And Josh, there's nobody in medical school, for instance, graduating today, who even knows about this because they did such a beautiful job eliminating this problem. In the 1990s, they worked on tobacco along with the West <laughs> Nile virus and contaminated water. So mm -hmm. Flint, Michigan, you have EIS officers to thank. Like they yep. are in the 2000s. The post 9-11 anthrax attacks. Remember those? Like this is we're finally reaching the era where, you know, some of our younger listeners might be like, oh, finally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, these are the folks, the uniformed officers who went through and in a, some of these in an emergency situation, some of these in a slow outbreak situation. Some of these for the Jack in the Box E. coli yes. 157H7 uh -huh, or uh -huh. SARS or even Hurricane Katrina. Yep. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. In 2010, uh, fungal meningitis, Ebola again. You think they would have gotten it the first time? No, no, unfortunately, and even up to the modern era, different strains and outbreaks of Ebola are happening kind of sort of all the time. 
So since its founding, these agents have been scattered everywhere a disease occurs without the general public's knowledge. Like they're just there, boots on the ground, fighting a very hot war uh, against microscopic enemies <laughs> to track yeah. down where they're coming from, how they're infiltrating us, and figuring out how to fight them. This is some serious spy shit, all done with nothing more than statistics and white coats, which I don't even think they wear out in the field. They, they <laughs> by and large, no, they'll wear uh, hazmat suits. I'll, I'll tell you that, you know, to, to kind of block the, um, the, the penetration of some of these things, uh, you know, either into your skin or, uh, you know, through the mouth and nose, etc. cetera. Um, yes, absolutely. It is taking histories, completing physical exams, tracing you know who has what symptoms where and in some cases josh this is f tracking down a known disease and, and finding the origin and and you know kind of cutting off the uh, spread of that disease at its uh, source or at its base and in a few other cases it has been discovering a, a new disease or maybe rediscovering an old disease and likewise finding out why it's spreading, where it's coming from. And then again, uh, you know, turning off the tap, making sure that it doesn't continue to proliferate and helping the folks who are there, the, the community doctors and stuff, cure the people who are, who are still there and, and helping them get better. So the modern EIS is a two-year hands-on, and let me emphasize the hands-on, uh, yes. postdoctoral training program in epidemiology, which I'm going to be honest with you, when I was in medical school, sounded like the most boring of all the medical fields. So yeah. <laughs> I wish somebody had told me I could have been a super spy if I had just cared about statistics a little bit more. Um, yeah, absolutely. There, it, it is very, very dry, and we do have to find a better way to talk about statistics. We say medical school. I say even all the way from high school, Josh. You know, because this starts out as just simple arithmetic, and it should it should be a much more important subject all throughout. Because for those of us who are in medicine, it helps us actually you know, save lives. But I would say that for those of y'all who are not in medicine, it also helps you understand disease and uh, and a whole bunch of other scientific concepts that make us more, uh, how do you say, literate in, as a whole. EIS officers begin their fellowship with a one-month training program at CDC headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. And this month-long introductory course is designed to transform the focus of these newly minted doctors from individual patients to the consideration of populations. So the first lecture that Langmuir gave when he was still alive, he got right to the essence. They were instructed in the epidemiologist's fundamental technique. Long division. Sounds exciting, right? <laughs> the calculation of rates that related cases of disease to the measured population in which they occurred. And he immediately told them, if you, if you haven't calculated a rate, you're not doing epidemiology. Abs yes. We are moving very, very quickly from qualitative or descriptive medicine, which I think is still important. It, it helps us, you know, understand the, the course of a disease, et cetera, to quantitation. And what he's describing on a very fundamental, uh, you know, level here are incidents, Josh. So how many times does a disease happen in a given population that is around or vulnerable and prevalence? So looking at a given population, what, how many of these cases do you see going on? And this can be everything from infection to trauma to things like heart disease. In fact, Langmuir so hounded, so imbued this idea and pounded it into the first EIS class, the idea of shoe leather or boots on the ground approach mm -hmm. that they designed sort of a mocking symbol that became the official symbol of the EIS, the print of a shoe 
with a hole in the sole worn through by persistent field investigations. And that's still their logo today. Go ahead. Look it up. I'll wait. <laughs> that is so cool. I absolutely love that. Yeah, yeah. Just very, very literal. This is what we do. And then, of course, you want to know, what does that actually look like? Well, I love that as I was researching this, several sites told me no discussion of the EIS course would be complete without some mention of the Oswego County food poisoning exercise. And I'm like, oh, of course. What is that exactly? And it was the first problem presented in the course and deceptively simple. In April of 1940, an explosive outbreak of gastroenteritis followed a church supper in the small rural village of Lycoming. Discover where it came from. <laughs> Trace it down. So this is kind of cool because I, I hearken back again to our friend in London, John Snow. No, not that one. Who, uh, you know, w- was tracing cases of gastroenteritis. In that case, I believe it was salmonella, Josh. Was that right? Or was it cholera? It was a... Can- uh, the Oswego County food poisoning exercise? Oh, no, it, no, no, the, the John Snow. But he... he oh, yeah, John at, Snow was cholera. Was cholera, right. So he traced out, okay, where's the diarrhea? Where's the diarrhea? Oh, okay. And almost like, you know, looking at a, a gradient. Oh, it's it's more here, more here, more here. Oh, there's the pump. And, you know, he he found the, the water pump where everything was coming from, just like that. So... This well, isn't... he didn't find the water pump till he went to the local beer factory and realized the only people not getting sick were the employees of the beer factory because <laughs> they weren't drinking water. They weren't drinking, but otherwise everything was kind of centered around one spot uh, in terms of like the, the prevalence of the disease. So this isn't anything terribly new, but it's a pretty cool, like, I'd say almost like a rediscovery or... Okay, but Jon yeah. Snow had to find a well in the center of London near a beer factory. Sure. Our EIS officers had to trace down not only the source, which was a staphylococcal contamination of ice cream at the church supper. Okay. But (laughs) that the infection came from one of the food handlers who had a small draining infection on her hand as she served and prepared the ice cream. Oh, wow. So they, they found the, in this particular case, which doesn't always happen, by the way, a, uh, like a patient zero type. Yeah. So that's, that was the traditional first case they were given, which is, how far down are you willing and able to dig to solve this? You know, a passing grade would be like, okay, yeah, you found out that what contaminated everything and caused this explosive gastroenteritis was contaminated ice cream. But did you know it was staphylococcal? Did you know it was from this food worker who had an injury on their hand? You know, this is the level of detail that these people are trained to sort of interrogate down to. So let's talk about what this course looks like. I told you it's a two-year fellowship. So the first month is really the only time you're on site at the CDC, and you get in-depth information and guidance on a whole bunch of topics like federal employment protocols, the competency requirements, how to investigate outbreaks, how to conduct epidemiologic research and surveillance, a.k.a. infectious stakeouts, to... (laughs) evaluate surveillance systems, analyze data, and even looking at things like collaborating with state and local health departments. Now you've got our Mulder and Scully who are there to be like, "Uh, we've heard a lot of people have been sneezing in this area. Is (laughs) Is that out of the ordinary for you? So this is, it's an interesting challenge, right? Because you do have to find out what's going on, but you can't be so disruptive as to, you know, basically mess up your, uh, your information sources. You do have to keep the trust of the people who you're trying to help. And to do that, uh, aside, like you can't just dig, you still have to respect their boundaries 
uh, you know, their privacy, if they say so, you do have to stay within the boundaries of the law. So Josh, no, no cowboy crap. (laughs) So pretty much when he says stay within the boundaries of the law, anything that you saw on house MD, don't do that. Yes. That that kind of like breaking and entering in order (laughs) That was Noah's bueno. You, when you are committing to caring for a population and a group of people, that means that you are respecting them as human beings throughout the entire process. So no going ape shit just because you want to quote unquote solve the puzzle. You're, you're still a doctor and you still have those obligations. So that's the first month. Then you also get a one week course in the fall that teaches you how to effectively communicate written and orally, visualize Mm -hmm. data, and presentation development, as well as communicating with news media. Oh, yes. Uh, Very, very important. Um, So you've got to be able to tell people about this in a proper and succinct kind of way. And, you know, the answers to a lot of these questions can sometimes be nuanced uh, and a, a little bit like interlaced and stuff. But for the public, you have to be able to break it down simply and and give them, you know, some like soundbite type answers that are still really accurate and helpful. For the remainder of their service, you know, there's also a one week summer course at the beginning of the second year to teach you scientific writing and a conference every year where the EIS officers present their work. And we'll get to that in a moment. But essentially, after that first month of training, EIS officers are assigned to operational branches within the CDC or at state and local health departments around the country. So there is an intelligence officer in your neighborhood right now. And (laughs) placement is, of course, a highly competitive matching process. Uh, People want to (laughs) be where the outbreaks are. Yes. Um, Yeah. And we, we actually we get into this to actually hunt down disease. So it's the op, you know, it's kind of the equivalent of, you know, the fireman or something like that. It's like, yeah, I, I came here because I want to, you know, help put out fires. So the CDC pairs EIS officers with a handler, just like spies. Each one gets paired with a public health advisor or PHA forming a EIS PHA operations team. Okay. Very cool. It's a very common recruiting pathway into the public health service commissioned Corps, which is a whole other episode. (laughs) Yeah. The, these two services do work hand in hand. So uh, it's important to be conversant with both of them, but yeah, we'll, we'll focus on the EIS this time. So Langmuir believed that each epidemic aid call, because remember, part of the mission was to lend aid to state and governments when they couldn't handle on their own. Each epidemic aid call was an adventure and a training experience, even and especially the false alarms, whereas local officials would be focused on a resolution of their specific problem the EIS officers were trained to bring a larger perspective, using their investigation to probe more general questions, looking into causation, as well as national concerns that may transcend the borders of the state being assisted. So you have research embedded in service. Yes. And this is terribly important. And it's, you know, this is why it's really important to have this national program in a setup that we have here in the United States. There are different rules and standards and everything that change by state. And sometimes state and county authorities are, they can only do so much based on, you know, what their resources and their rules are. But now here you have a national group that can bridge county, uh, state and local services together. Um, augment them with other folks who are, who are helping them out and then be able to, you know, kind of expand their search from maybe like a county out, uh, you know, broadly. And sometimes this is very, very necessary when you're crossing a state border, um, say like between California and Nevada, but the outbreak is crossing that border. So you need a person from the EIS to actually help broaden the search like this. 
I'm just picturing a local scientist driving all the way to the border going, oh, no, it's beyond my jurisdiction. No, no. <laughs> well, it's a little bit like that. But that that, you know, that local uh, public health officer may not be able to legally obtain records, uh, you know, or go through patient files or this kind of a thing. Because, again, we still do want to protect our patients' privacy rights uh, and all that other stuff as we're, you know, searching. So Langmuir insisted each instance of epidemic aid conclude with both practical recommendations for control of the immediate problem. Don't show up and be like, oh, fascinating. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. You, you have to help. Exactly. <laughs> so practical recommendations for control of the immediate problem and the prevention of recurrences. Mm -hmm. The officer, just like, you know, again, remember, this is a, a commissioned or uniformed branch. A final report had to be written that defines the problem, described the methods of the field investigation, displayed the epidemiologic analysis, you know, calculate the rate, discussed the results, and then presented the final conclusions and long-term recommendations. And these are all a fundamental feature of how these intelligence officers are trained. Yeah, so the the bridge across here is is really important and kind of amazing you cannot just be the aha person in this case you know you you can't just like you said you can't just be like the you know fascinating and then you know kind of uh, piss off you you do have to provide care and help um to the public health officers on the ground and then the the people, of course, who are being afflicted. So you, you have to be of service. But the broader service, which is really cool, is now you have collected this data and information. So should this outbreak happen again? Or should it happen in another area? Or something like it uh, has happened? We now have wisdom and intelligence to build on. Now, during their yearly conference... Even to this day, the Alexander D. Langmuir Prize is awarded to a current officer of the EIS for the best scientific publication. The award they get is a $100 cash prize, an engraved paperweight, a case of ale or beer, just like the John Snow Pub in London would give out, and okay. an inscription on the permanent plaque at the CDC. Awesome. Now, let me tell you some of the winners from past years. And when yeah, I say yeah, past please. years, these sound like Sherlock Holmes cases, okay? Okay. 1967, an outbreak of neuromyasthenia in a Kentucky factory, the possible role of brief exposure to organic mercury. Okay. 1968, right. salmonellosis from chicken prepared in commercial rotisseries, report of an outbreak. Okay. All right. 1971, tomato juice associated gastroenteritis plaguing Washington and Oregon. Nin See, uh, 1973, uh, outbreak yeah. of typhoid fever in Trinidad. 1971, traced to a commercial ice cream product. Oh, <laughs> I love these because this is, you know, these are kind of classic things we learn about in medical school. And, you know, when we want to think about, oh, what's the risk factors for these diseases? Uh, we've learned this from these these investigations. That's so neat. 1981, respiratory irritation due to carpet shampoo. Two outbreaks. Car <laughs> oh, gotcha. So this was actually, you know, talking about... Uh, you know, a, a product that maybe shouldn't be used. Sure. 1987, oral contraceptives and cervical cancer risk in Costa Rica, detection bias or causal association? Right. And uh, this is amazing because now we're talking about, uh, you know, understanding how a cancer can be transmitted through a virus. And Josh, this is part of the wonderful body of data which led to ultimately the hpv vaccine that is now preventing cases of cervical cancer and then this one is my favorite 1995 yeah. a multi-state outbreak of e coli o157 h7 associated bloody diarrhea and hemolytic uremic syndrome from hamburgers the washington <laughs> wait wait the yeah. washington experience <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, I get you. I get you. Yeah, I that's amazing. H1 sorry, 0157H7 E. coli and understanding that you know, this was a cause of first of all the bloody diarrhea, meaning that we were able to track down that it had picked up a uh, a, a toxin from Shigella and, and was now, you know, a, a, a scary source of this type of disease that's dysentery. And then of course in children that it was the trigger for hemolytic uremic syndrome, uh, this, you know, very frightening consequence. And this was kind of a jumping off point to understand where this came from and why. And, you know, it, it has thus far, helped us find other cases uh, with, uh, you know, hemorrhagic E. coli and, and toxigenic E. coli and, and track it down faster and stop the cases from spreading because we have this experience in our, in our back pocket. So they study all these things and they're at the forefront. And of course, the last four years have all been related to COVID investigations. Yes. Yeah. Unsurprisingly. Um, yeah. But for strong disease detection systems, international health regulations call for one epidemiologist per 200,000 people. And many, many countries have not met this goal and likely never will. Yeah. So this is an, this is an ideal. And this is, by the way, not, not a, um, a, a newbie EIS officer or a, or a beginning EIS officer. In this context, we're talking about a fully trained kind of proven field agent, one per 200,000. So, yeah. And that's what they do is once you've trained domestically, they start sending you all over the world on super spy disease missions because these field trained epidemiolog these field epidemiologist training programs, FETPs, <laughs> then okay. leave our country and help other countries build critical global health security capabilities to expand their public health workforce. Yeah. So I, I want everybody, this is very, very important, all of our listeners, okay? There's going to be some of you folks that are, you know, oh, how come it's just not helping out the domestic kind of a thing? Listen, we are all on this planet together, and we now have seen a, a pandemic start in a smallish city in China and make it very quickly all around the world. So, people... If you think locally and act globally, um, you can actually, you know, prevent epidemics and pandemics from reaching your back door or your front door by attacking it anywhere at the source where it is anywhere around the world. So given all these clear historical panels like EIS officers after training serve on the front lines of public health protecting Americans and the global community, training under the guidance of seasoned mentors, and when disease outbreaks or public health threats emerge, they investigate, identify, and implement to prevent further spread of disease. Tell me that's not some James Bond style <laughs> business. Yeah. Now, this there is, is so cool. There is a movie, there is one and only one movie I can think of about the EIS. And it's a thrill ride, although it's a little hard to watch in a post-COVID era. Oh, and that is, as in like emotionally difficult. Yeah. And that is, of course, the film Contagion. Are you familiar with it? I, I'm i familiar. I don't think I've ever actually seen it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bad infectious disease doctor. I, I, I have not... Uh, you know, uh, actually so uh, watch it through. It's currently on Hulu. Okay. It was made in 2011 okay. by Steven Soderbergh with Matt Damon, Lawrence Fishburne, a couple other big names about the threat posed by a deadly disease and the international response. And we follow one EIS officer as they race to figure out where contagion begins. Uh, so. Okay. Here's how uh, this is real tough. It has Gwyneth Paltrow in it. Well, uh, <laughs> so here's well, here's the oh, no, no, it's OK, though. Here's okay, the thing. Okay. 
when Gwyneth Paltrow returns to Minnesota from a Hong Kong business trip, she okay. attributes the malaise she feels to jet lag. However, two days later, Beth is dead, or two days later, Gwyneth is dead, and doctors tell her shocked husband, Matt Damon, they have no idea what killed her. Soon, okay. many others start to exhibit the same symptoms, and a global pandemic explodes. Doctors try to contain the lethal microbe, but society begins to collapse as a blogger fans the flames of paranoia. Oh, oh. <laughs> so this is a little interesting because uh, uh, there, uh, Gwyneth has been known to blog, I believe. So <laughs> the movie itself was inspired by an outbreak of the Nipah virus, not the COVID Right. Uh, so Nipa, I believe, is is one of the other hemorrhagic fever viruses. Uh -huh. But a lot of it draws parallels that I think all of us can identify with in this day and age. Um, so worth a watch. And you really get to see the firsthand experience of what EIS fieldwork looks like. Now, we mentioned the counterpart to the EIS is the U.S. Public Health Service which is yes. a uniformed service. And they actually have, I know we're not really talking about them a lot because we're, we're running a bit short on time, but okay. I just want to include that they have a March like with lyrics. Oh, Oh, like a, like a John Philip Sousa type March. Yeah. And, yeah, okay. and I don't know the tune, but I'll tell you the lyrics. Okay. Because it's just great. <laughs> the mission oh, the yeah, go ahead, go ahead. The mission of our service is known the world around. In research and in treatment, no equal can be found. In the silent war against disease, no truce is ever seen. We serve on land and the sea for humanity, the public health service team. <laughs> I love this. So this is a march that you would talk about, you know, as a, for instance, you know, the Marine Corps have their famous march, the Army, the Navy, etc. Um, a, a march was created for this uniformed service. Yeah. So that's awesome. That's it for this week. Next time, we'll come back and tell you a little bit of counter espionage, the secret history of the CDC. Oh, OK. Very nice. <laughs> Very nice. Because yeah. I don't think I don't think you know everything there is to know about the CDC, Santosh. I I don't think so either. I'm I'm learning quite a bit, and I I thought I knew about the EIS. I will tell a wonderful story because uh, I I do want people to know the Infectious Disease Society of America, which is uh, one of our you know our our uh, big academies here talking about infectious diseases here uh, in the United States. Uh, when we go for ID week or, you know, the, the actual annual uh, meeting, which actually this year is going to be in, in Los Angeles, uh, they get together and there is a section of meet the EIS. And that's it's it's one of the most popular panels uh, that they do over there to talk about. So I thought I knew a lot about it and what they did, but uncovering the history and all the cool stuff that they do uh, just makes me super excited and happy. That's awesome. So that's it for this week. As always, we love to hear your comments, questions, and feedback. If you'd like to support us spiritually, emotionally, or financially, links to do that are in the show notes, along with links for further reading. You can also sign up for our mailing list and find out about upcoming live tours and performances that we will be doing, or just, you know, shoot us a message to say hi. <laughs> We love hearing from you. Uh, if you have episode ideas, if you have questions that you want us to answer, anything and everything that we could do to expand your interest, your knowledge in uh, health and medicine, we are here for you. We are on all the podcast platforms, all the social medias, and we're even on TikTok now. So find me at Dr. J Talks Medicine. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. As always, uh, the show is produced by me with a lot of help from Dr. Santosh and friends. Our theme music is composed by Rachel Leisure. 
Until next time, keep a song in your heart, soap on your hands, a shot in your arm, spin a globe, and when you've done all those things, pick a place to go investigate a disease, and uh, <laughs> uh, happy travels. Bye, everybody.